live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Budapest. I hope everybody had a good week and is looking forward to a safe, healthy and productive weekend. In this class, we are looking at the listening section of the IELTS exam. Specifically, we're covering parts three and four of exam six today. Uh, we did one and two yesterday, so if you were in class, great. If not, that's okay as well. Uh, you'll be able to pick it up from here. Um, students, uh, while we wait for some of your classmates, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com. For academic IELTS, visit us there to get all six of our full practice exams, over 100 hours of video lessons, and a fully interactive uh, course for your phone, uh, tablet, PC. Hi, Elena. Good to see you in the class. Hi, Flower Sun, Anatoly. Nice to see our regular students. Uh, and for general IELTS, check us out at gieltshelp.com. Again, we have lots of great materials to help you improve your English communication skills and, of course, get those better band scores. We've heard back from our users that as long as they spend a couple hours a day for four to six weeks on our website, they tend to improve by one band score in at least a couple, if not all of the sections of the exam. So keep that in mind. Hi, Neha. Nice to see you in this class again. Hi, Dr. Krishna. Um, again, students, our websites look like this. We'll be using this one for the listening audio today. Uh, click that big red button to join the academicaehelp.com website there with the blue background. And for the general one, it's the same idea except the green background. Of course, the uh, reading and writing sections are different for this website. That's why we have two websites. And click that big red button. In fact, I never said this before, but maybe some of you are thinking, why do they have two websites? Well, because general and academic students are usually very different. Um, so, uh, and they're two different versions of the exam, except for listening and speaking. So it makes sense to kind of have two different websites. Okay, that's the logic of why we have that. All right, everyone. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, just send me an email, adrian at aehelp.com. Uh, tomorrow, we will have more live classes as well. Uh, we'll have reading for members, and then we'll have speaking part three for everyone, okay? So more live classes coming up tomorrow also. Now, we'll get right into the listening. So for the listening, for those of you who have our exams and such, uh, this is going to be part three three starting. Um, it's CD6, track three. I'm going to use my microphone to play the audio and uh, I have maximum volume on my end here on the speakers and the computer. So uh, if it's quiet, please turn up the volume and uh, use a headset if you have one so you'll get some better sound. So we'll get right into uh, listening part three here to warm up those uh, ear muscles, if you will, the little bones of your inner ear, the cochlea. And um, please, uh, please, 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 uh, students, don't write your answers in the chat. Write it on another piece of paper and another document, uh, just so you're fair to everybody, okay? Give everybody a fair chance to answer on their own. So don't write the answers into the chat. Please write it into um, a separate document, okay? So I'm just going to hop over and go to my student account here. Uh, of course, uh, when we're in my student account, we have a tour of all of our goodies. And again, in your my student account on both of our websites, you have these computer-based exams, online academic courses, PDF study plans, uh, lesson videos. And then now we're going to just go into our audio CDs and move on to uh, track three of our sixth CD. There's lots of audio for you to improve your listening skills as well. So here we go, everyone. Get ready to listen and answer. Now turn to section three. 
take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a radio host and his guest discussing the virtues of various art forms. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. All right, welcome back everyone. Our next guest is a curator of a major art gallery in the city who has just released his second book on the virtues of art. We're pleased to have Mr. Edgar Patterson here today. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. And please call me Edgar. Edgar, of course. Now, in your first book, published four years ago, you focused on performance artworks such as plays, musical concerts, films, and other such works. Your second book is a little closer to home for you. It concerns purely creative fine art. Well, yes. It deals with the aesthetic virtue of different painting styles. Okay. So give our viewers a quick rundown on what your book is about. Does it make an argument? I mean, does your book take a position on a certain issue in the world of art? Yes, my book does take a position and a rather radical one. The main thesis of my book is that the meaning we associate with a painting exists purely within ourselves. This is in stark contrast to many commentators who believe that the author of a painting gives the painting its meaning. Under this framework, if an artist intends his painting to represent the fear of an orphan child, then this is the one and only meaning such a painting can have. We might call this the intention theory of art. Conversely, my theory is that no matter what the intention of the author is, the meaning of the painting comes from the viewer. The meaning is exactly what the viewer thinks it is. This solves an important problem with the intention theory of art, namely that we do not have access to the mind of the artist and therefore we do not have access to the painting's meaning at all. Very interesting, Edgar. But doesn't the intention theory work as a sort of grounding for artistic analysis? What I mean is, while we may not know the meaning the artist intended, isn't the point of art to try to discern this meaning? If art is just whatever we want it to be or feel it as, doesn't that somehow make it less valuable? That's an astute critique of my position, but one I have an answer for. My response is that art is not merely what we want it to be or feel it as. We can still participate in our critique and interpretation. All I want to say is, in the end, it is up to us to discern the meaning and value of paintings on our own. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, let's talk about one type of controversial art, abstract art. How does your, can I call it a subjective theory of meaning? Yes, that is fair. Okay, how does your subjective theory of meaning apply to something like modern or abstract art? Art which doesn't tell an obvious story or have a clear meaning. Many people think that such works of art have no meaning at all. It's certainly an interesting case, but one which my theory is well matched to deal with. You see, abstract art has its critics. Like you say, they think it has no meaning at all. However, other people think abstract works of art have all sorts of meanings. Now, under the intention theory, most of these commentators will be wrong, since the work of art either has a meaning or it doesn't. And if it does, then it only has a single meaning so under the intention theory, only those critics who discern the specific meaning of the artist will be successful. My theory, however, results in each critic being correct in their own way. For example, if, after critically analysing a certain abstract work of art, I determine it is meaningless, then it is meaningless. 
Because the meaning of an artwork comes from within, I cannot be wrong, and neither can other people. The critic who sees a metaphor for suffering and the critic who views it as something entirely different are both right. We are all correct in our interpretation, as long as we give given the painting a fair critique. What do you mean by a fair critique? Well, I mean it is not enough to merely look at a painting and write it off immediately as meaningless. One must go through a certain process. That said, there are certainly other... That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and make sure to check your answers uh, in the 30 seconds. So um, this is uh, part three of the listening. Of course, it's more challenging than part two or part one. Um, how did you feel about this? Was it challenging or, uh, or not too bad? What did you feel? Let's go over the answers together. And I'll give you some strategies as we do that. So was it difficult? Was it challenging or was it okay? Derek says, it was too hard. Um, yeah, so a couple of interesting and important points to keep in mind. And I'll make a note of this as well. Um, I want to uh, clear up a couple of misunderstandings about the IELTS exam. So does anybody know what IELTS actually stands for? So I E L T S. So a couple of people said, oh, it wasn't too bad. Some people said it's difficult. Um, yeah, it was about speech. Okay, so IELTS, just to, before we go through the answers, just a couple of important points here. So IELTS means the international. English language testing system, okay? It is not truly a test of ESL. I think a lot of students make the mistake. Yeah, so Apu says it's the International English Language Testing System, good. So um, one important point to make here, students, uh, when you're thinking, ah, oh, this is too hard, or this part's difficult, or the speaking is challenging, or the task to writing is challenging, uh, do remember that it's an international English language system, language testing system. It is not a test of ESL. It's not the international English as a second language testing uh, system, okay? I don't think that exists. So um, IELTS is taken by native speakers to prove uh, grade 12 uh, English proficiency, also for ESL teaching jobs and for immigration. So did you know, for example, students, that if uh, a native English speaker does not have grade 12 English and they plan to immigrate, to move to another country, like somebody from the U.S. to Britain, but they don't have grade 12 English, they can be asked to take the IELTS exam. In, in fact, they'll need that. Okay, so it's not an ESL exam. Uh, why am I telling you that? So some of you probably know this, some of you maybe don't, and some of you are probably going, um, why are you telling me that, okay? So it's because there is no mercy in the IELTS, okay? Uh, the IELTS listening section is not the same type of audio that you hear in an ESL class, okay? It is natural speed, natural conversation, using idioms, and different styles, or different, I should just say different diction, okay? Diction means different styles of speaking, okay? It's just the same as if you walk into 
uh, a school in an English-speaking country, or you're listening to the TV or the radio, okay? So, um, yeah, Gamer King, it's not as easy as people hope it is. So Gamer King says it's not as easy as we think, but it's not as easy as uh, people hope it is, okay? So the IELTS is an English language testing system. It's not an English as a second language testing system. So be ready for challenging part three, part four listening, okay? Now, um, having said that, I'm gonna give you some strategy here as well. So uh, here we go, going back to uh, the um, questions. So question 21, how many books has the guest written? Did anybody catch that? Okay. So how many books, according to the audio that we just listened to, has this guest written? So Abhishek says it's two. Uh, Kuldeep says it's B, it's two, and you're right, two books. Okay, uh, another question for this one before we go to the next. Um, how many times do we get that answer? So how many times did we hear this answer? Once, twice, three times? How many times did we hear the answer is two? Only one time, two times, or more than two times? Can anybody tell me that? So uh, Satora Kaitova says twice. Hamant agrees, two times. Yeah, that's right. So this answer came two times. Okay, twice. So the IELTS is not cruel. Uh, they do try to help you. The answer was said twice, okay? I'll show you that in a minute. So the correct answer here was B. Let's keep going. Let's keep giving some answers, and I'm going to give you some strategy for multiple choice after we go through the answers. Uh, number 22, what description does the guest give his book's thesis? A position, a radical uh, thesis, the intention theory, A, B, or C. So for 22, what was the correct answer, A, B, or C? Shirojidin Abduhoikyov says it was B, and you're correct. It's a radical, okay? So he says, my book's thesis is radical. So here you have to know the meaning of thesis, position, radical, intention theory. If you're lucky, you might guess that it's radical from what you hear, but you have to understand this word, and you have to understand these words, as well, and then you actually know for sure, without question, that the answer is B, okay? Because a radical thesis means it's a thesis that's a little bit different than the usual, okay? Yeah, you're right, Haman. He does clearly mention it as long as you're paying attention, for sure, okay? So, so far, B, B. Okay, um, number 23. Which statement best describes the intention theory of art? The author creates an artwork's meaning, A, the meaning comes from the viewer, or C, there is no meaning outside the viewer's intention, A, B, or C in this case, number 23. Okay, so intention theory, theory just means an idea or an argument. Okay, so the intention idea of art. All right, Sutora, Apu, Kaldeep, very nice. Correct answer is A. Okay, so the author creates an artwork's meaning. Now, again, if you know the meaning of intention, okay, then you can figure out logically that this has to be the correct answer because intention means my will or willpower. Another way to think about it is what I want to do. Okay, so I'll give you an example. My intention is to teach you good strategies for IELTS. 
So that means what I want to do is teach you good strategies for IELTS. That's my willpower. That's what I'm willing to do. That's right, Nathali Nikiforova. So what I intend to do, okay? So what I intend to do, if the intention of art idea makes sense that way, then it definitely means the author intends the meaning of art or the author creates the meaning of art, okay? The reason I'm showing you this is because one of the keys to getting multiple choice questions correct in part three and part four is to understand the vocabulary and the language in the question. If you understand the vocabulary and the language in multiple choice questions in the exam, then even if you don't catch it in the audio, you can figure it out. So a lot of students say, oh, but the audio was too fast and I couldn't hear it or I missed it. That's okay. Even if you miss it, even if you don't hear it, if you understand these words, then you know what it is. IELTS is not based on a guessing game. It's not a game of go fish. It's not like, oh, red fish, red fish, that means that's the correct answer. No, it's a, it's a test of English, as we just said, okay? All right. So next one, 24. What is the biggest problem with the intention theory? And of course, if we understand these words so far, we can get this one correct as well. So what is the biggest problem? Is it A, we do not have access to the mind of the artist? B, the intention is not our own, so we cannot discern it? Or C, it lacks grounding? A, B, or C? Maja Besednyak says it's A. And you're correct. Okay, so in your answer sheet, you put A. Uh, we don't have access to the mind of the artist. If you see a painting, and uh, this is my painting, what do you think that is? Okay, what do you think that is? You don't know because you don't see inside of my head. I want to think this is a cat wrestling with a bird. Um, so it's a cat fighting with a bird. That's what I think it is. You don't know that because you can't see inside of my brain. You're not a telepath, okay? Um, so the problem with this intention theory is that we can't access the mind of the artist, okay? All right. So uh, those are the multiple choice questions. I'm going to uh, give you uh, a couple of strategies for multiple choice, okay? So here are some strategies to practice and think of. Um, I think we had a student yesterday, Ice Bear, I'm not sure if they're here today, as asking about these. So multiple choice question strategy. Okay, firstly, what I just said. So understanding the vocabulary and information of these questions will often provide you with the correct answer using good logic without necessarily hearing the audio, okay? So what does that mean? If you miss the audio, you can still get the right answer in many cases. Okay, so keep that in mind, all right? Uh, number two, when you review these questions during the preparation time, change the questions, I said this yesterday, into statements in your mind. Of course, you don't have time to write it down. In your mind, as you will most likely hear these as statements. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so what I mean by that is, um, here's number 21, it's a question format. How many books has the guest written? So you're likely to hear this as, oh, so you 
have uh, written number of books so far. Or, okay, uh, your first, let me, your first book is, and the second book is, so you'll hear something like that. Okay, now I'm writing this down, and at home, when you practice multiple choice questions, you should write down what you think you might hear so that you train your brain to understand this, okay? Um, now, uh, during the exam, of course, you have to do this in your head, all right? So, and then check the transcripts too. So check the script in the back of the book. Does that make sense? So does it make sense the value of changing questions into statements so you can listen to the answer or listen for the answer? Here, let me uh, show you the uh, transcripts here, what they actually say, and then you'll see what I mean. Okay, so here in our exam book, you can see the, uh, the transcripts. Okay. And then you can see what they say. Now, in your first book, published four years ago, you focused on performance artwork, such as plays, musical concerts, films, and other such works. Your second book is a little closer to home for you. It concerns purely creative fine art. So this is how they say it, just like I wrote, your first book and your second book. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks, Zikrudin, for saying, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. And then here is actually the first time that you hear it. So those students who said, actually, you hear that answer twice, you do. Our next guest is the curator of a major art gallery in the city who has just released his second book on the virtues of art. So here you hear the actual host say it as well, second book. Okay. Azar, you can write um, the statement onto the question booklet, yes. Uh, in the preparation time, but you need some really quick writing skills for that. So in the real exam, I recommend doing it in your head, okay? So there's a little bit more expansion there. So when you review these questions during the preparation time, change the question into statements. Uh, number three, and this is really important as well, is do not expect the answer to jump out. So instead of the, uh, a do, this is a do not. Uh, do not expect the answer to jump out from the choices. Okay. So when you're looking at the uh, choices, let me just jump back to uh, the questions here. Okay. So when you're looking at your choices, um, one, two, or three, uh, don't expect them to jump out because this is one, two, three, but as you heard, uh, the audio doesn't actually use one, two, three. The host says second book, and then they say your first book and your second book. So they use first and second, uh, so they don't actually say one, two, three. Now, of course, when you have words and then when you have sentences, this becomes even more difficult. So don't just think, okay, I'm gonna stare and the answer will go boop and it'll jump because I heard the word uh, intention. So it must be this one because I heard the word intention. Uh, no, that's not necessarily true, okay? So be really, really careful trying it that way. It doesn't work. Again, it's not a game of go fish, okay? Go fish is a children's game where you have to match the same colored fish, like blue fish, blue fish, yellow fish, yellow fish, okay? So IELTS is not uh, that kind of exam because then it wouldn't do what it needs to do, which is measure English ability, okay? So do not wait for the answers to jump out. Now, another strategy that you can do, okay? So, 
So another strategy that you can do is write down the keyword that you think is the answer and use it later when you transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, remember that you have time to transfer your answers to the answer sheet, and you also have time to review, okay? All right, so in that 30 seconds at the end, okay? So what do I mean by that, okay? So let's say, for example, this question, what is the biggest problem with the intention theory? Um, maybe you caught something about, well, we don't know the artist. So you write down, don't know artist. Okay. So you quickly write down, don't know artist on your question booklet. And then later you realize, okay, now I have to figure out if anything here can help me. Uh, we don't have access to the mind of the artist. Oh yeah, that's kind of the same as what I wrote down. So I think that's the best answer. So I'm going to choose A, okay? So if you catch a keyword or phrase that you feel makes sense and it's a possible answer, you can quickly jot it on your question booklet and then later you can go through the longer sentences in more detail and figure out which one matches what you think you heard. Okay, instead of trying to stare at these and figuring these out, because these are often paraphrased, all right? Rui Souza says, okay, I got it, I got it. All right, Rui, thank you for that. Hopefully everybody else picked up on that also. So those are the multiple choice strategies that you should practice, okay? So number one, uh, use your logic. Logic can greatly help you even if you don't hear the audio. Number two, change questions into statements in your mind. Okay. Number three, don't stare at answers in hopes that the answer will jump out. And number four, uh, if you think you heard an answer but you can't quickly see it in the choices, write it down and then later match it up. Okay. Those are the key strategies that you should practice. All right. Okay. Uh, questions 25 to 26. So that's a bit of strategy. Okay. All right, um, questions 25 to 26, write no more than two words, always pay close attention uh, to the instructions, okay? So according to the host, one of the main goals in art critique is to understand a painting's something and the intention theory seems best equipped. So what's the missing word, okay? What's the missing word here? What was the answer? Can somebody tell me? It's just one word. And it makes sense when you put it in. It makes a lot of sense. Anybody catch that word? Haman says it's the interpretation. It's close, Haman. You'll do. It's very good. So good. It's meaning. Yeah. So when we look at a painting... Most of us want to figure out what it means, right? We stare at it in hopes of figuring out the meaning of that word. Absolutely. Interpretation, um, it's subjective. Meaning is a little bit better, okay? So according to the host, one of the main goals in art critique is to understand a painting's meaning. And the intention theory seems best equipped for that. They might take interpretation. It's a very close synonym, but uh, meaning's better for sure. Okay? Don't overthink it. Uh, number 26, the guest responds that art is not something what we want it to be, but that we must also participate in critique and interpretation. Anybody catch this one? Saul says that's merely... And you're right, Saul, it is merely. Okay, uh, merely is another word for just.
okay, or only. So it's not only what we want it to be, not just what we want it to be. The most uh, accurate word is merely, that's what's used in the audio, is not merely what we want it to be, okay? It's also testing your vocabulary to see if you know the word merely as a synonym of just or only. All right, now we had this interesting uh, table um, where some of you might have thought, oh, that's really difficult, but good news. It says complete the table, answer right or wrong for each question. So it's like a game of coin toss. Okay, you have a 50-50, even if you're just guessing. Um, however, hopefully you're not just guessing. So the intention theory means the author gives the meaning. Okay, um, the subjective meaning theory, what does that mean? So according to this audio and the host and the writer of the book who creates this idea, uh, the intention theory is the author gives the meaning. The subjective meaning theory, what does that mean? Uh, Maya's asking, do we lose marks if we give the wrong synonym? Um, Maya, if it's a really close synonym, sometimes they'll give it to you if it's mentioned somewhere else, okay? Uh, but it's usually best to give the exact word that you hear. Okay, so what is the subjective theory? Yeah, so Charlie Sen says it's the meaning of the viewer, so the meaning given by the viewer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Charlie. So if you understood this much information in this audio, that the intention theory is the author giving the meaning, the subjective theory is the viewer giving the meaning to a painting or a work of art, uh, then um, this should be okay, all right? You should be able to figure this out, again, without necessarily needing the audio. So the situation is the critic thinks critically about an artwork and judges it to have no meaning, okay? Uh, according to the intention theory, the critic is right or wrong, number 27. So if we think about this logically, so if the author gives the meaning, and if in the situation the viewer says, eh, this painting has no meaning, is the viewer correct or are they wrong? Okay, Charlie, Farios Beck, Pooja, and a lot of you are saying wrong, and you're right, okay? So they're definitely wrong. Why are they wrong? Because the author gives the meaning, and if the author says, like I said earlier, it's a cat fighting with a bird, then it's a cat fighting with a bird. And if I say you have to give me a million dollars for this beautiful uh, painting of the cat fighting with the bird, it's up to your choice whether you do or not, but that's my belief, so it's wrong. Okay, so the situation is the critic does not think critically about an artwork and judges it to have no meaning. So in this case, the viewer says, Mm, okay, I'm looking at this painting, I, whatever, it's just some lines. Uh, intention theory says that they're wrong. The subjective uh, uh, meaning theory, 28, says that it's, what is it for number 28? Okay, so does not think critically. Pay attention to these kinds of answers, okay? The answer here is also wrong, all right? Because the uh, guest in the show says that you can't just quickly look at a painting and say it has no meaning. You have to look carefully because if you look carefully at the painting or the artwork, uh, a statue, and suddenly you realize, oh yeah, there is that cat fighting with the, I can see the cat, I can see the bird. How many times has that happened? Then you can say that it has no meaning, but otherwise you can't say it has no meaning. You can't just quickly look at the painting and say it doesn't have meaning, okay? All right, um, number 29, critic understands the author's meaning. Critic is... Right or wrong? So the critic understands. So the critic looks at the painting and says, oh yeah, that's a bird fighting with a cat. 
are they right or wrong according to the intention theory? Yeah, they can be right. Okay, a lot of paintings, they you can see exactly what's happening. So it's right and right. Exactly. So wrong, wrong, right. Those are your correct answers. Okay. All right. Uh, last question. Uh, by the way, students, hopefully you're realizing that these questions are what's called inferred questions. You have to listen to the audio, understand what they're talking about, understand these questions, and then get the right answer. Why does IELTS do this? Because for this kind of question, there's absolutely no guessing. This is why companies and uh, countries, immigration, like IELTS more than TOEFL, TOEIC, or any other kind of uh, multiple choice exam or other exams, because IELTS is accurate. Um, it's very difficult to just randomly guess answers in the IELTS exam. Okay, that's, that's not an effective strategy. Okay, um, so here it's another inferred question. A or B is the correct answer. So the art critic is viewing a painting for the first time and wants to critique it using the subjective meaning theory. Determine whether the critic has satisfied the constraints of the theory with regard to his critique of the painting. Number 30, the critic looks at the painting for a moment and concludes from his initial impression that the painting lacks aesthetic value. Aesthetic value means is not beautiful, okay? Lacks, meaning it's not aesthetic beauty. A, the critic has satisfied the demands of the theory. B, the critic has not satisfied the demands. Number 30. Navneet, Devas, very good, it's B, okay? Why? Because the critic is only looking for a moment and they initially conclude that it has no meaning. So it's the same as question 28, okay? You have to look for a while, all right? Okay, everyone, that's great. So uh, let's keep going here. Now we're going to do uh, section four. Get ready to listen. Again, don't put your answers into the uh, chat. Just wait till the end. We're going to do this uh, nice and smooth. There's no breaks in uh, part four of the listening. So uh, here we go, everyone. Get ready. I am going to get the audio going ASAP. Again, if it's quiet, turn up the volume. It's max on my side. So I'm going to hop back to our website here for the audio. And here we go. Everybody ready, steady, go. Battery, 70% to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a lecture about road infrastructure and its connection to economic prosperity. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Roads have been connected to economic prosperity for millennia. The first roads were thought to have been created by repeated animal grazing and then utilized by humans as ready-made routes for travel between adjacent lands. These roads, evidence for which exists going back 12,000 years, were likely not connected so much to economic prosperity as to survival itself. These roads allowed hunter-gatherers faster access to greater swaths of land. The first paved roads were used in ancient Egypt about 4,500 years ago. Historians theorize that these roads were the first roads used for trade in our history. These roads also would have been used to transport items, such as building supplies. Though rivers were much more practical thoroughfares for the transport of goods, certain goods from certain areas could not be transported by boat. 
and this necessitated the creation of roads for economic reasons. The Silk Road, though not precisely a road, is one of the most famous trade routes in history. Composed of many types of road, the Silk Road stretched from China and Thailand in the east, all the way through the Middle East and terminating in Western Europe. These different routes of the Silk Road brought myriad items from the east to the west, including, of course, silk. This brought economic prosperity to China and surrounding regions for many centuries. The Silk Road was so valuable for commerce that it persisted for over 1500 years. The Roman Empire was the first major manufacturer of a system of roads. At its height, the Roman Empire contained 29 major roads, totaling over 75,000 kilometres. That's enough road to go round the world twice. Notably, this is almost the precise total length of the modern United States interstate highway system. These roads connected the vast lands of the empire and brought an intertwined economic prosperity to the diverse regions of the empire. Furthermore, the roads were used for military transportation, giving the Romans a massive strategic advantage over their less advanced adversaries. Through the Middle Ages, roads continued to be built and used for trade and commerce, though technological advances were virtually non-existent. Though tar-based roads were used briefly in the Arab Empire in the 8th century, this technology would not take off for another millennium. Today, our roads and highways connect our communities, countries and economies. They are the modern trade routes by which we are all connected to each other. The modern world would not be possible without the vast expanse of road infrastructure. One interesting development in the history of road infrastructure was the advent of underground systems. The first such system, the London Underground, opened in 1863. Such subterranean routes greatly increase the volume of human life that a city can sustain, thus increasing that city's economic output. London would not be a fraction of the economic powerhouse it is today without its underground rail system. The same can be said for virtually every other major economic centre. Underground systems are the next generation of economic generators. While roads move goods which create economic prosperity, underground systems move human capital which creates further economic prosperity. What is the next great advance in ground transportation? Some futurists have theorised about a system of tubes propelled by air pressure or other means which would transport individuals vast distances in short times. Such a system could move humans at unprecedented speeds, perhaps with an economic footprint far less than that of subterranean networks. Such tubes could even be built underwater Imagine such a system connecting New York to London or Tokyo to San Francisco. It would be incredible. Whatever lies ahead for humanity, roads have gotten us to where we are and they are very likely to play a prominent role in getting us to where we will be next in one form or another. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, so that's roads. And the importance of roads in human history. So let's go through the answers nice and quick. I'm going to give you the answers uh, for this one. So uh, what phenomenon created the first roads? Uh, the first roads were created by animal grazing. Grazing means feeding. So uh, herd animals like cows, sheep, when they eat the grass and uh, the plants and such, they're grazing. So animal grazing. The roads were necessary for the transportation of many goods. What was a much more practical thoroughfare? Thoroughfare means mode of travel or transportation for the transport uh, of goods in ancient times. That would have been rivers rivers are countable and you need a plural on that one 
Okay, rivers, not boats, rivers. All right, so animal grazing and rivers. Keep a score of what you're getting right and wrong because we will add these up in the end. Now, the professor talked about the Silk Road, the United States interstate system, um, ancient Egyptian roads, Roman roads, and which of these roads totaled approximately 75,000 or totals 75,000 kilometers? That would have been A, okay, United States interstate system and the ancient Roman road network. So A would be the correct answer there in your answer sheet. All right. 34 and 35, these are two questions, so careful when you put it into your answer sheet. What were two benefits of the Roman system of roads? B was one of the correct answers to transport the Roman armies. And E, of course, for trade. So uh, that would have been for the economic prosperity or the economic financial uh, part of the Roman Empire. Okay. All right. And then 36 to 40, you had to match A, B, C, and D to the correct question here. Applies to ancient roads, applied to the subway systems, applies to future transportation, or all of the above. Um, increases economic prosperity. Which one is that? All of them. D. Okay. Um, responsible for the growth of modern cities? That would have been subways, modern cities like London. Okay. Used for military transportation? That would have been A, because we don't use our highways so much for military transport. Military uses other roads usually. Uh, 39 moves human capita, so moves humans, that would have been B, subway systems, and then uh, will move humans at unprecedented speeds around the world. Uh, there's the future participle will, so future transportation, you guessed it, C is the correct answer there, okay? All right, so those are your correct answers. Uh, students, add up your um, answers. And if you were in yesterday's class, please uh, add those together as well. And I'll show you where you can get your band score estimate, okay? So, or your band score exactly, all right? So, uh, yeah, Violet, you need the exact answer for those multiple choice, okay? So Abhishek says 29. Now, if you go to the website at ahelp.com, okay, and uh, you go to the bottom of the website, you'll see a score calculator. And I know it's bright, so I'll darken that up. Just give me two seconds. So the bottom of the website has a score calculator for you. Here, uh, where is it? There it is, score calculator. So you can click on that. The general version of the website has it too. And then you can put your raw score into the uh, listening. Okay. Um, so Rimshaw says 29. So Rimshaw 29 uh, would be a band score of 6.5. Okay. Uh, Shirojidin says 31, 31 would be a band score of seven. Good job. All right. Uh, Alex Joseph says 26 from today and yesterday. Uh, 26 is still 6.5. Okay. So that's about the range of that 6.5. Uh, Violet Nguyen says 14 out of 40. Uh, 14 would be a 4.5. Violet. Okay. Ice Bear says 34. Four out of there you are, Ice Bear. So you heard the multiple choice strategies from today, I guess. Uh, 34, Ice Bear, would be 7.5. Okay. 
Um, you'll do 28. That would again be 6.5. Nikham 27 would also be 6.5, I believe. Yeah. Um, Devas Karki says 20. Uh, 20 is 5.5. Okay. All right, uh, students. So you can check that out. That's on the website. It's free. You can use it anytime. Uh, there's all, a lot of actual uh, free goodies on the website, so you don't have to pay for everything on our websites. There's a lot of free goodies. You can even try the course for free and get access to free videos and materials also. Uh, to do that, students, uh, go to aehelp.com for academic IELTS and g-i-e-l-t-s help.com for general. Again, if you have questions, students, you can send me an email, uh, adrian at aehelp.com. And tomorrow, members, it will be a reading class and then followed by a speaking part three practice and strategy. So that's it uh, for today, students. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday. I hope to see you in tomorrow's classes. You are very welcome, Eugene. I always appreciate those emojis. They put a smile on my face. You're welcome, Divas. Welcome, Alex Shirojidin. Also welcome, Charlie Sen. Bye, everyone. Much love to all of you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye for now.